long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow, and I am Father Matthew Cowth, and we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Ten Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen till I know I Hello, Father Winslow. Hello, Father Kath, how are you? I am fantastic. Good to be with you, and uh, I want to Just take a quick moment to thank the people that help us with this. You know, we've gotten so much great feedback from people and and it's encouraging. Because the production value is excellent. The production value is excellent. And so they've made it so easy for us to do these things wherever we go and whenever we can get together. Um, So just a shout out to uh, to 10 uh, publishers for having worked this out for us. And Frederick, who works at the seminary with me, for we basically just hand this stuff off and they, they do the magic. So... Our yeah, it's wonderful. Easy. We just sit around and talk. It's true. So it's true. No, the the people are great over there. They've always been so good. Such a wonderful Catholic family um, that that owns and operates Tan Books and uh, St. Benedict Press and right. a, whole, a whole slew of um, good Catholic companies that help the faithful have access to the types of things that they want to have access to, um, books and other things. So. It's fantastic. And now there's a yeah. whole new world with digital media and content and things like right, that. Right, so right. all those sorts of things that are available. Matter of fact, we were just explaining to the bishop, what what, what are we doing with these podcasts? That's right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what are you doing? Yeah. No, it's true. Well, so here's something that's been on my mind recently. And it's in part born out of, it's a question born out of experience, not just an academic question. So it's it, born out of experience. It's leading me to an academic question. Now, I have, you, know, you and I have engaged in a prayer life over a long arc of time. And since we entered into seminary, we were handed the divine office, Liturgy of the Hours. Mm-hmm. And that repeats on a, 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 most things repeat on a four-week cycle. Some things on a one-week cycle, some things on an annual cycle. And then uh, we pray it, right? So after a number of years, you know, we're circling back around so many times with the same yeah. psalms, yeah. Uh, with same prayers, intercessions, and so on and so forth. So I recognize that when I pray the divine office, and I'm maybe hearing the words slightly different in this moment of time than maybe I did previously, but nonetheless, I am saying the same words. And in this experience, and reflecting upon this experience of recitation of something over and over and over and over again even if not just like a Hail Mary that's repeated ten times in a row but it's like something that's on a four week cycle or a one week cycle at some point it this is a feeling not a thought mm. at some point it feels like didn't I already say this like how many times do I have to keep saying it mm. and there's a, there's something that almost feels And again, I'm talking about feeling. It almost feels futile. Um, I said it. I meant it when I said it before. (laughs) And now I got to re-say it and re-say it and re-say it and re-say it. Um, On the other hand, I can't imagine my life apart from a routine of prayer. Yeah, a life where it was just given over to more capricious or... um... Quadly metal, you need some structure. Whatever you wish, right? Right, right exactly. Just kind of go with the wind, and yeah. um, that would be hard. I mean, you would have to have some structure. But I guess it's kind of go- going down to the words of it all. Um, and with the rosary, it's slightly different, right? Because you're meditating on the mysteries. Yeah. Uh, so there is. We talked a, about that in a meditation the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas with praying the divine office, or in some types of devotions, right, where people are. I don't know, they're praying a series of novenas or they're praying something they pray every single day. Doesn't it, I don't know, you get the back of your your mind, our Lord said, it's not the mere recitation of words, right? right? And yet we do it. 
And I figured you would have some, <laughs> you know, highfalutin theological points to be made. But that said, I'm coming, I'm, these comments are made only from experience. I experience, on the one hand, a great gratitude for the structure that's provided by this routine of these types of prayers. Yeah. This is not the summation of a prayer life, right? But this is this is an element to which we are bound uh, through through sa- through sacred orders. We commit to praying this divine office. Yeah. Um, but on the so uh, so I'm grateful. On the other hand, I sometimes think, how many times do I have to say these things, right? Like, yeah. at what point? Is well, I think it's a great question. I'm just recently, for whatever reason, um, coming into a, I mean, overly revelatory, coming into a new phase where I'm really enjoying the divine office again. Hmm. So uh, this is a perfect question it's, at yeah, this it, moment for and you. It's, for some reason, it's just lighting up. Like I'm looking at it in a different way than I ever have before. Um, and... I don't know what that qualitative difference is. I would say, I, I would say that I've, I've shifted a bit relative to it being an opus day. What I mean by that is, the, the office, the officium that we are obliged to say. First of all, it's an obligation for priests, right? There may be people that have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah, sure. So priests, like um, monks of old, um, have a pared down sort of um, method of prayer that we do, and we call it the opus dei, or the work of God, because it's what we do for the faithful. We promise to pray this for the faithful. It begins what a, that in is, the morning. It begins in the morning with a series of prayers, psalms, readings, and then it goes again in later morning into, a, again, psalms, readings. And these, these readings in the second, for the rest of the day, come just from the scriptures, whereas the first psalms and readings can have some lives of the saints and various things like that. So they have different um, cycles depending on which hours yeah. you're reading. And so the traditional the traditional terms were... Lo- uh, so matins, matins is the first one, which refers to the, the dawn or the, the morning mm-hmm. time. and Lauds. Lauds, which is more for praise or morning prayer. Ter sex non, which is the three different hours. Mm-hmm. Um, for daytime. Nine, noon, and three in the daytime prayers. And then vespers, which has to do with that evening tide. Uh, evening prayer, and the last one is a compline, or the, uh, the completion of the day, the the, the night prayer. And which then when is you finish, mercifully always very short. Even in the old rite, it's short. When you're fatigued, because the church realizes that you're not going to pray very well yeah. right before you go to bed. And then um, you go to bed, and you wake up, and you start again. You start again. So yeah. you get the sense, yeah. you know, you you enter the seminary in '93, and I entered since '93. We both entered in '93. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. So since 1993, well, that was that 30 years now, right? Yeah. So for 30 years now, we have been on this routine. Yes. A daily routine that repeats. And I, I tend to feel the onerous nature of it. First of all, let me just back up and say that what priests were required to do prior to the council, mm. the breviary, it's called the breviary, which is an, it's sort of an abbreviated form of what the monastic office was. It's something that's portable. You're not singing it in choir necessarily. You get your own books. You say them to yourself. You're supposed to say them with your moving lips. You're supposed to say them audible, um, interestingly enough. But um, what we were required to do before the council was is difficult. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It was a lot more. It's the same more, breakup yeah. of the hours, but they added many more psalms, versicles. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took a lot of time. And I've done that breviary before. Um, I wanted to get engaged with it when I was in Rome. Studying just because I wanted to see what that was like, and I, it's really it's it, it is a real yeah. burden, um, and so burden so far as it it, it takes an awful lot. It's of a time. sacrifice, a prayer. And you and I were in seminary where it, it doesn't take a lot of time to to no, do the, to the hours, the divine office, and we kind of give ourselves more over to the devotional time or the rosary or meditation, etc. But Especially in the old office, I found if you tried to hurry um, to get it done in any way, shape, or form, it became such a burden. So that's just like we say about the cross, right? If you don't carry it, you'll get crushed by it. Mm-hmm. And the same with the, with the office. If you don't carry it properly, it's going to crush you. In the old office. The new one, you can get done so fast, not paying right. attention. But nevertheless, as you say, 
like I get to some office of readings that I've never liked. I never found them to be interesting, mm-hmm. and we're stuck reading them again. Right. And the circle comes around again, and here it is. I'm like, why do I have to read this thing again? Right. I remember exactly for the last 30 years what it said. <laughs> I didn't like it for the last 30 years, but I got to read it again. Mm-hmm. And so for a long time, I began to see that in, 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 in a similar vein to where the old mass, the, the old traditional mass, saw the readings because people oftentimes will say like we you know and back then we wouldn't have understood the readings you get your own missal etc but there was a different emphasis we've spoken about this before that that the readings were done in liturgical setting not at some point in life of the church not for the purpose of letting the faithful hear those things but as part of the preparatory offering you're giving god's word back to him before you give his incarnate word back to him in the sacrifice so it wasn't didactic it wasn't for the purpose of someone knowing exactly what was being said Um, which is why the priest had to say it even if someone else sang it because it was part of the offering which is an interesting sort of thing, mm-hmm. and when that when you see the, the the divine office, the liturgy of the hours, connected to the to your work in that way, um, and you realize that I've got a whole parish of people that aren't praying this, I've got a whole cadre of people in various parishes that I've been at um, for whom I am obliged to pray. I've got the whole church for whom I'm obliged to pray that are not going to pray these things, um, and when I saw it as a kind of work that I'm offering to God for them. Mm-hmm. A priest sacrifice it ceased to be mm-hmm. something particularly personal, right? Um, it didn't we, matter if I got something out of the particular reading so so much, et cetera, et cetera. Now that had its, I, I'll, I'll stop here, but that that had its own detriment too, because I I ceased to see it as something that was feeding my spiritual life, right? Um, it, it, it's both and, really. it's both and, and only recently. Have I really begun to enjoy it personally again, mm. and as for my own spiritual life? Like I, I can't hardly get through it anymore. It's even though it's so short, mm. relatively short, but I get stuck on phrases like I cannot believe I've said this for thirty years and I've never seen that. That's it. It's like, okay. have I been alive? Uh, yeah. Say, say uh, this song. For- <laughs> why does that seem like somebody added that since the last exactly. four weeks ago when I read it last? Oh. Yeah, it's. It's one of those things, and so it kind of got my mind thinking, because on the one hand, if there's a weight to repetition, yeah, and again, a, a sensation of futility, like never having completed, yeah. right? In the sense Sisyphus, that you're just you're rolling the stone up to let it fall back down and yeah. roll it back up again or whatever. It's, it's never actually delivered, so to speak. Yeah. It's just a sensation. Because I, I know to the contrary, right? I know that that act of prayer is received, right? So that is delivered, so to speak, right? But th- this is the feeling yeah. of it, right? And then on the other hand, I'm also acutely aware of how needed it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of those structures. Again, we have other um, components to our prayer life that allow for freer thinking, uh, freer contemplation, whether it's silence, silence in front of the Blessed Sacrament, or even the meditations of a rosary, or you know, scriptural meditations, a sort of Lexio Divina, that sort of thing, right. where you have uh, a different experience. So I'm really just kind of honing in on the, the repetition stuff. Uh, that is even that even that sounds degrading. I don't mean it that way, but the stuff that's just repeated, repeated, and repeated. Well, you, you remember our dear friend um, Father Gerber who used to say because he got. In, in Easter, you say the same Psalm. psalms every single day mm-hmm. because it's still Easter day in the octave. Right. And one of those psalms is the that sort the of beautiful of... canticle of all the, the, the blessings. And so, you know, ice and snow bless the Lord, light and darkness bless the Lord. And it was about sixth day of the octave, and our dear Father Gover just said, everything on this page, bless the bless Lord. Bless the Lord, exactly. <laughs> Just because it's part of that Hebrewism that doesn't have superlatives. Right. The repetition. They like the repetition. And mm-hmm. you can you can easily say to someone, do you get tired of saying, I love you, you know, to the person that you love? Right. Well, no. And yes. Yeah. In other words, there, there like, are don't times you believe in which me? I'm not feeling right. the same kind of... Or I said it to you, Hello? you know, yeah. well, last week. Why do we have to say it again? Right. Um... But I, and I get that sort of passionate 
um, movement that you have, let's say when you fall in love, when you're first, you know, falling in love yeah. with people, et cetera, um, when you get the, your first girlfriend, whatever else, and yes, you love hearing it as many times as she can say it, and you love saying it as many times as you can. But that's just the nature of infatuation at the time. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying it shouldn't carry on into the, into the spiritual life, but there are times you just don't feel that. Right. And so you don't want to say it again over and over and over. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's just because you don't feel it. It's not the right thing to do. And so I think you, you feel it as a, you, you have an experience of it being a work that's not complete, something that's slightly onerous, and something that's even a bit annoying at times. So the way I find sometimes with going to Eastern Rite uh, liturgies, mm-hmm. um, very repetitive. How many times do they say, "Lord, have mercy"? Right. And I, I get pretty impatient after yeah. about the hundredth time. It's like we said this, I'm like, either you're going to have mercy or not at this point. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm it's getting like, to. You know, how, uh, is, am I the woman knocking on the door that won't leave you alone until you give me mercy? Right. Right. Um, see, and I, I thought of that. Right. Yeah. Like, is this is this part of that persistence, persistence. that our Lord uh, that our Lord holds up as an example? Yeah in prayer um so you know like i say i was thinking about this uh sort of more theoretically coming out of this experience and part of it was there's an element to the prayer uh that's eternal and cyclic things are a way to represent eternity Mm. in a linear timeline right right and so it's kind of where my mind was going. It's it's a way of manifesting something eternal by yeah, its repetition. That, that makes sense. And and I and I can feel that right. But on the other hand, uh, what I say on the other hand, I say in addition to that, um, we we so long for that eternal that it does get fatiguing that I have this repetitious cycle inside temporality. When I want to experience this in eternity, right? Right. So there is an right. element I think that is appropriately fatiguing, in the sense that I'm made for. I'm being called to this eternal communion, um, when it feels a little more arduous because of the current circumstances in time and not yet having is totally fulfilled in eternity. Hmm. I don't know. What are your thoughts there? I'm just thinking about of it. Of all the different um, heresies I'm touching upon? No, 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 no. I, I, it, it, I mean, time is a really interesting topic. Oh, yeah. And aspect. Mm-hmm. You have both time and verbs, and you have sort of aspect and verbs. It's a slightly different thing and in terms of, in terms of grammar. And I've, I've been thinking about this recently um, and how many different tenses we have mm. and what words are actually doing. Um, in those tenses in terms of the verbs because we don't have only certain aspects of language are subject to time I mean, most of them are not right mm-hmm. you know, you're, a noun isn't subject to time it's just it's a substance even though in right. itself it goes through time right and the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up now is because I, repetition requires time mm-hmm. right and so you're feeling the tick tock right when you repeat um, and there's a yearning for the eternal. There's a yearning for the eternal. And you don't actually... And you feel like you're on a treadmill and I'm trying to get you there. You can't get And anywhere. I'm just spinning. <laughs> you're, you're back on the elliptical machine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that makes really good sense. Um, and I think your notion of it, when you mentioned eternal, what what made me think about that as opposed to as opposed to something linear where I am trying to get to a particular goal, if if I were to think about it, as something that's puncturing um, my time, that I, yeah, I did say, "Lord, have mercy," five minutes ago, and I'm saying it now, and I'm going to say it in five minutes, and I'm going to say it again in five years, in fifty years, if I'm alive. Um, that I'm, I'm instead of going instead of going linearly forward, I'm, I'm going up into a request that I can never stop making. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm engaging that. That, that more of that eternal sense of I am in a position of needing your mercy all the time. And I'm going to articulate that. Right. I'm going to participate in that thing that's always I'm going to re- represent my eternal desire, my yeah. eternal cry in a temporal way yeah. by repetition, uh, by, uh, by things being cyclic. 
I'm not sure how many people are aware of the fact that you know the circle has traditionally mm. kind of represented eternity in a certain way, and or, or the infinity symbol, right? Right. right Just right. that if you start at one uh, one point, you're going to return and you follow the lo- the 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 contour of the circle. You're going to come right back to where you were. So there's that sense of never ending circle, cyclic. Um, same thing with the infinity signs. This um, same sort of concept. And so that's where the connection between eternal and something being cyclic or repetitive can kind yeah. of connect. And, and, and I mean, you, you and I know, because we've talked similarly before, we know how we communicate, but those listening may not be figuring no, 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 out why certainly. the cyclic um, can and, represent and, and eternal. I think, it's, I think we can say legitimately that in the spiritual life, presumably or hopefully, um, these things aren't simply cyclical. It's, it's more... Of, of a helix kind of structure, right? I mean, mm-hmm. in other words, you're you're kind of coming almost like a corkscrew. It almost sounds like spiration. Spiration, yeah, that's true. So imagine if you're coming if if you're coming to the same point, but you've you've entered in a bit deeper into the cork, like a corkscrew, right? And you you keep coming around to that same thing, but mm-hmm. you're hopefully in a different um, a different depth, yeah, or height, whichever one you want to go to. Um, yeah, that makes sense, because it you you do feel like that every year that it comes around again. Um, not that I'm necessarily getting more profound, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's not the same. I'm not coming at it at the same me as we do with all the. Well, that's it, year. right? It's a different moment. Uh, it's a different evolution of me, or hopefully evolution, not a devolution of me. Yeah. But um, you know, there is there are enough circumstantial differences. To make the whole thing new and not a repetition. You know, they said about St. John, um, the Apostle, that at the end of his life, he just stopped saying anything new. He Mm -hmm. just kept saying the same thing, which was love one another. Right. Um, Because he had had been with the Word himself. He had heard all of the particular words. He had articulated that, that conversation in his own gospel. He had tried... Um, I shouldn't say tried, he did uh, manifest the wildness of the book of the apocalypse um, in written form um, as an instrument of God. And all of those many, many words and all of those um, signs and parables and fantastic things, importance in the sky and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as he kept going around cyclically uh, toward the end of his life, it just got whittled down to one thing that he kept saying. Yeah. And somehow that encompassed and the encapsulated totality. everything that he had said before. And that's something. Yeah. He wouldn't say anything more after yeah. that. Yeah. And he didn't get tired of saying it, they said. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. But, well, because it does kind of capture sort of a uh, a purpose to mm. the to the repetition uh, that it is a matter of honing into a fuller depth of meaning. Yeah. Uh, that 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 is evolving. So you say, Lord have mercy, you know, with a journey of faith, that expression, those words, uh, take on more with deeper, yes. deeper understanding. Yes, yes. Uh, such that in this case, he he lands on the central thesis as he sees right. and understands it, and there's no more to say. There's no more to say when I you mean, properly suppose, understand it. Right, and that's I suppose it's the same with I mean analogously, right? With with the father, the father only says one thing. <laughs> the sun, right? yeah. Speaking that word, um, and I think that we, I feel like that sometimes at, at my age with the seminarians, when I get together with my friends who know my history uh, and who know my 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 story, my narrative, etc. I, I I don't have to say as much. I can say X, and you know the letters of the alphabet that came before X, right? Whereas with them. I don't feel like saying all of those letters. Yeah. Um, like you couldn't possibly understand yeah. um, what I mean Where by that's coming this sentence. From the how, history. how much yeah. this thing has germinated and matured. Or you could say one word and yeah. someone who knows you and understands the context and the history yeah. would understand it so much more profoundly. Yeah. yeah and that's one of the great beauties of, of, of long-term friendships, you know, that someone else has been woven into your story in such a way that you don't have to go back and recount everything all you the time. You cannot have a shorthand. Yeah. 
And yeah. it's a meaningful shorthand. It's not a way of yeah. uh, d- being dismissive. It's actually a way of uh, expressing to another that, you know, I understand you. Yeah. And uh, you, you, all you have to do is say one or two words, and I get where you're coming from. I know yeah. it's... If I say to you, if I say to you, help each other, it's going to mean something totally different. Exactly. Coming from me to you. Yeah. Um, just because of our own common history and yeah. things we've known and phrases we've used and whatever else. Then am I saying that to anyone else? Exactly. Um, because it's more than just the words. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's good. I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know if I launched us into a two theoreticals. Oh, I know this one. This one could take us a while. Cause this I'm, one could kind of get heady, but it, uh, but I, hopefully people find it interesting. A, a glimpse of the life of the priest, in the sense that um, maybe some of you didn't know that we have an obligation to pray the divine office, mm-hmm. or that it had this repetitious cyclic reality. So sometimes you'll see priests, and it looks like they're reading their phone in church, mm. or it looks like they're um, have like a small <laughs> Bible, uh, whether it's the small Bible looking breviary right, right, or the right, one that's right. now digitally available on the phone. That's what the priest is praying. Yeah. And you know what the, the, we do this it's the day in and day out. You know, when those for, when my smartphones first came out, I was, I was, I had forgotten my breviary because the breviary is kind of big and bulky. And so sometimes if you're traveling, if mm-hmm. you're walking, you don't want to bring it with you. Mm-hmm. And I was living in Rome at the time and, and I stopped in a church to say daytime grab. And I'm looking to my left and to my right. And I'm kneeling, right? So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I and I'm pr- I prayed on my phone, and this is really the beginning of smartphones and that kind of thing. That pretty early on, mm-hmm. and this <laughs> wonderful Italian woman came over and yelled at me for for, for using playing on my, your phone, playing on my phone in the church. <laughs> I was so proud. Were you of her. able to show her? I did. I said, "I'm trying to. I'm looking. I'm praying. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it." Uh, um, and we're, you know, kind of God getting heckled her. in Italian. But I kind of agreed with her. I mean, right. I, I hate using my phone in the church. It I, seems a more. I know the seminarians do it, um, and you it's, feel different about yeah. using it in that way. But nevertheless, you're right. You can't presume that a priest is doing something uh, like texting. Right. Exactly. Uh, if he's uh, in the church on his phone. You know, it's it's likely, at least given the benefit of the doubt, that yeah. he's pulling up his divine office. Yeah. And so we do this, and we do this for the, the sake of a sacred um, vocation, a vocation, right. the sacred ministry, part of which is praying daily. And so, so integral is it to the life of the priest that it's one of the promises we make that the faithful have so little knowledge of. Yeah. You know, they think, okay, oh, celibacy, um, obedience, and, uh, you know, in the case of religious, those who belong to religious communities, having a vow of poverty as well. But for the for those of us who are diocesan priests to have these these promises of, of, of obedience and uh, celibacy, but to have to it a promise of prayer, in yeah. particular, a prayer to pray this divine office for the sake of the church, right. meaning all the faithful. Right. I mean... That's I kind of think about it. I, I think if you polled your average Catholic, they would have no idea that there was anything beyond celibacy and obedience. They would throw in poverty, but they wouldn't make the right distinction between diocesan priest and a religious right. priest. But that aside, they would have no concept That's probably that we true. actually make a promise of prayer, of yeah. specifically that prayer. Yeah, for them. For them and for the whole church, mm. which is why we can recite um, psalm texts that are so contrary to our mood, right? You can have very... Right. Joyful, right. chipper, yes. and you're not in that mood, or you could have some very somber things, and you're joyful and chipper. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's not about you. Yeah, it's in the mystical body somewhere. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Well, that is a topic. This topic certainly we could stretch this one out for we several could. other Absolutely. ones. Maybe we will. Um, but before we go, I have new uh, tenants at the seminary. Great Danes? No, although the Great Danes are involved. Oh, no. Um, I have four new piglets. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> are, are we saying tenants rather than pets because they're going to be slaughtered at some point? Exactly. So we don't want um, to get emotionally too close. I mean, to of course, tenants. everyone's already coming up with names for them, like Abraham. <laughs> oh, oh, my Lord. <laughs> Okay. Oh, right. Um, there's so, so many names floating around right now. Now these, um, so these are the the types of piglets that are butchered eventually. Right. Six months. Yeah. That's it. That's it. It's it. 
Yeah. How much food do you have to give them? Well, part of my reason for doing it is that we throw away so many scraps, right? Ah, um, and recycle. In addition to sort of a compost pile, I, I wanted it. Like, imagine we're carving up vegetables for this many people. You're yeah. going to get odds and ends and things. That, yeah. And then in addition to things that people don't actually eat. Yeah. Um, and so I figured we we'll just re- that turns back into food for us. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> So are they furry? But they're furry, yeah. So are they furry pink? Are they furry they're black? Furry black, yeah. They're really are they, cute. They're are they really cute? cute? Well, now because they're small. Now right? listen. So here's the the stupid move of the day. The Great Danes never go after anything except for deer. They love chasing the deer. Mm-hmm. And even brought one back in his mouth one time, right? But mm-hmm. aside from that, right. um, they don't really go after anything. They don't do anything. They're, right. they're, they're pretty lazy. They're laid back, as you know. Um, and so I didn't think that they would go after the pigs. And the pigs are in an electric fence um, that we built. And it's a pretty large fence and a large area, right, for the pigs to roam around in. Okay. The whole pigsty and the whole thing uh, that we built. And so I take the dogs there to introduce the dogs. And frankly, to let the dogs get zapped by the electric fence. To know. To know. And so the first Dane goes up there and sees the pigs and starts to run at him, hits the fence and steps back. The second Dane looks at the first one like idiot, and he leaps over the fence in no. one bound. Chases after the piglets. Oh, the poor piglets. The piglets get to the end, hit the fence. They get zapped. Oh, the no. Dane gets zapped because the Dane can't stop that quickly. Of course. And destroys the fence. No. And all the piglets run off into the forest. No, they're yes. gone? They were. I had them for 10 minutes. They're 10 totally minutes. gone. Well, here's the story. Okay. So then Farmer Ted Kauth has to go find piglets. How do you catch piglets? I don't know. Right? So so I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what to do. So I'm, I'm, Put a, I'm bringing food hot around. Hot dog on a I'm stick. Shaking I, food, I'm shaking food in a barrel. Yeah. But they don't know me. And they're not used to that sound coming yeah. from me. So uh-huh. I'm not associating it with food. So I put food along the trail, um, hoping that they'll pick up on the food and sure. find their way back. It was a comic book story. Oh, no. Like, I was playing Frisbee with the guys in between the classes. And... All of a sudden, there's four piglets on the field. No. They came out of nowhere. All, the, all, all four. Yeah, they're all together, right? So I try to get behind them. The boys try to corral them. Uh-huh. They try to push them back toward... Did they escape? Uh, and they just got, you know, they, they as a foursome, moved like a little flock of, of, of birds. Yeah. They totally evaded us back into the forest. They did not. Yeah. So then I'm walking outside um, in between uh, a couple of things. I was going to the car and then they're out there staring at me, oh. <laughs> right? And I try to do the they're same thing. You. They run off. So then I'm like, forget it. Um, at this point, the Danes are going crazy because they've been stuck inside all day. They've yeah. got this smell of pig. They want the pigs. Oh, no. Um, so I take them on the opposite part of the property. And all of a sudden, within like five steps into the woods, I see their noses go up in the air and they take off like jackrabbits. Oh, no. Like rats. So they go down the trail, obviously chasing the pigs. Well, that was an earlier part of the scent, though. The pigs had doubled back. And I turned uh, around, and the pigs were right next to me. They were not. Yes. The danger they ran in the opposite direction from a previous scent. Because they were going down that wrong and path. The, and the wind was in the opposite direction. And but the they pigs came... were behind me. They look at me, turn around, and run down the trail. All four together. It's like a comic book. Oh, And my. finally... Um, I went back up to the pen in which I had put the last of the food from various trails I yeah, laid yeah. down, put a big hoard of food yeah. in the middle of the pen. Pice them in. It's gone. They had gotten in there, eaten it, and left again. They did not. Yeah. These little boogers. So now we're really saying Italian, right? So I'm I'm in the pen with Deacon and Deacon is our facilities manager, Deacon Mueller. And we're in the back of the pen. I'm going to put some more food down. I'm like, I don't know how we're going to do this. Like, I can't sit here and wait for them to come in. Right. And as we're talking, I turn around and they're staring at me again. How far is, away? This is. They were on the other side of the property ten minutes before, right? Right. And they're they're 15 feet from me, staring at me. They are not. Yeah. Outside the pen. Outside the pen. Right. So they see the food there, and they're staring at me, and I'm staring at them. I walk the other direction. The fence is off. I jump over the fence. I leave. I let them see me leave. So they I, go I double back around and I hide in the bushes and I wait for them to keep following the trail long enough to get past the gate and I close the gate and they're in there. Oh so they're my. Quite so what, what are you going to do? 
You have to have a higher. Fence. I have to figure out what to do with the dogs. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is put them on. I didn't have them on a leash. I'll put them on a leash. Let them shock themselves a few times and get the picture. I guess um, it's just nine volts. It won't hurt them. Right. So um, that's like a, um, it's an electronic fence in the sense that that's a virtual fence that the leash operates from. So can you? Draw well, a no, no. I have a virtual fence as well on their collars, but I got to reset that to keep them away from right the um anyway it was just fun oh my i don't know if we'll ever slaughter the pigs i just kind of want i think it's important for seminary and the sisters and to take care of things yeah um to have responsibilities to realize what it requires to take care of things mm-hmm. um and i'd like to kind of the whole recycling process i kind of find fascinating. yeah i think it, i think that there's uh something quite natural and yeah. beautiful about you know that what do they call it subsistence living yeah where you you, you kind of feel on the order of nature yeah. where you fit in you don't just know it from a exactly. book exactly you feel it well when the guy he's a great friend of ours he was in the seminary once and he's got a great family he's a homesteader he brought me the pigs and when they got out i'm like what do i do now and he's like welcome to homesteading you think it's just a, <laughs> i think it's just a a ball of relaxation yeah. out there in the wilderness. <laughs> this is what it looks like every single day. Murphy's Law. Something happened you didn't expect to happen. Yeah. And I said, what do I do? He's like, I don't know. You're a pig now. <laughs> it's like, they'll probably come back in a few days. So. And they, well, they were they did? And they, and they, they came back that day. Together. He couldn't believe it. I called How up, big are they? Um, I'd say that the size of a, um, a rugby ball. They're tiny. Yeah. Wow. Now, now yeah. I can see the pigs. They're really cute. And you don't have names yet. No, no. Well, you took my one, one last thing. I don't, I don't have anything to add. I can't compare to the pig it's story. It's the pig story, yeah. I mean, we'll, that's extraordinary. We'll end the pig story this time. We got it. We got to end the pig story. I you got to come see them. They're really I cute. I can't add anything They're to fun. that. All right. All right. God bless you all. Ciao, ciao. Makes me want to scream From the to the screen Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. From the Rooftop.